Good morning. My name is Lise Grande, and I'm the head of the United States Institute of Peace, which was established by the U.S. Congress in 1984 as a national, nonpartisan public institution dedicated to helping prevent, mitigate, and resolve violent conflict abroad. USIP is very pleased to welcome everyone to today's important discussion on peace and democracy in Myanmar. It is an honor to host this side event during this year's Summit for Democracy in partnership with the Global Democracy Coalition. We are particularly pleased to welcome Aaron Barkley, who serves as the Acting Assistant Secretary in the Bureau of Democracy, Human Rights and Labor, and as the Coordinator for Global Democratic Renewal at the U.S. Department of State. It is an honor to welcome Mo Zhao Wu, the Deputy Foreign Minister of the National Unity Government of Myanmar, Ambassador Scott Marcial, Joanna Kwao of IRI, and Christina Fink from George Washington University. The cause of global democracy was dramatically set back in 2021, when Myanmar's military overthrew the country's democratically elected government. Overnight, the gains achieved by Burmese citizens and communities during the unprecedented decade-long expansion of democratic freedom were brutally torn away. Burmese have fought back, staging widespread nonviolent protests in the days following the coup and supporting the resistance movements that have reemerged across the country. The military has responded with extraordinary repression, and yet Burmese are uniting around the singular goal of overthrowing the coup to establish a federal democracy. Today's discussion is an opportunity for us to learn from the leaders of the pro-democracy movement and discuss the role of the international community in bringing an end to the violent conflict and our role in supporting the building of a democratic and peaceful Myanmar. Aaron, allow me to hand the floor over to you. Thank you so much, Liz, um, and thank you for welcoming me here today. I want to thank USIP for hosting this panel and bringing together such a distinguished group of participants to discuss the urgent crisis in Burma and the critical role of democracy in shaping a peaceful and just future for the country. As next week's Summit for Democracy makes clear, democracy is and remains the best vehicle for fully realizing our human potential and improving people's lives in tangible ways. We will continue to champion it around the world. Nowhere is this cause more important than in Burma. It is my distinct honor to speak with you about the U.S. government's policy to addressing the worsening crisis in Burma and the concrete actions we have taken to support the people of Burma in this time of crisis. First, let me emphasize that despite international condemnation and calls to end the violence, the regime has only es escalated its brutality against those who aspire for an inclusive federal democracy. The regime has carried out executions of pro-democracy activists, political leaders. It has conducted airstrikes against schools, concerts, and places of worship, and killed scores of women, men, and children using an array of weapons. Tragically, the March, 20, the March 11th massacre of at least 28 people sheltering in a monastery in Shan State is only the most recent example of the regime's brutality. The regime has thrown thousands of peaceful protesters in jail and torched entire villages, leaving 50,000 homes in ruin and nearly 1.4 million people internally displaced since the coup. There are reports that the regime has also engaged in torture and horrific sexual violence against people across Burma. The regime's scorched earth tactics have provoked a catastrophic armed conflict and thrown the economy further into disarray. We now face the specter of a multi-sided civil war in the heart of Southeast Asia. The people of Burma have made clear they do not want to spend another day under a military dictatorship. The United States will continue to support them and all of those working for peace and a, and a future inclusive democratic Burma. I want to take a moment to highlight the impressive and unprecedented collaboration among Burma's many pro-democracy elements, the National Unity Government, the National Unity Consultative Council, the committee representing the Union Parliament, 
ethnic organizations, religious organizations, and civil society. And I greatly appreciate the attendance of representatives from some of those groups with us today. A genuine democratic Burma cannot exist without the involvement and contributions of all of Burma's various ethnic groups, including Rohingya. This leads me to the various lines of effort the US government is pursuing to support inclusive democracy in Burma and a peaceful resolution to this crisis. First, we are stepping up economic and political pressure on the regime to promote accountability for its atrocities and to push the military to the negotiating table. To mark two years since the coup, we rolled out a new round of targeted sanctions on January 31st in lockstep with our partners from Australia, the United Kingdom, and Canada to impose greater costs on the regime. The sanctions targeted six individuals and three entities linked to the regime's revenue streams, including the senior leadership of Miana Oil and Gas Enterprise, arms dealers, regime leader family members, and their business associates. We also sanctioned the Union Election Commission, which the regime has manipulated in advance of its flawed election goals. To date, we have sanctioned a total of 80 individuals and 32 entities to deprive the regime of the means to perpetuate its violence. Diplomacy is also key to isolating the regime and denying it international credibility. Last December, the United States joined our partners in the United Nations Security Council to pass a resolution calling on the regime to cease the violence and uphold human rights. In the coming months, we will continue to urge Burma's neighbors to use their channels with the regime to persuade the regime to change course. And we are using all diplomatic tools available to engage with our partners in ASEAN, including to support their efforts to urge the regime to implement the five-point consensus. We applaud ASEAN's downgrading of Burma's participation in its most senior meetings, and we welcome ASEAN Chair Indonesia's leadership in establishing the ASEAN Special Envoy Office on Myanmar. The United States looks forward to working closely with Indonesia this year to make progress in resolving the crisis. Second, we remain intensely focused on facilitating unhindered humanitarian access. We are redoubling our efforts to ease the suffering of those afflicted by the worsening humanitarian crisis, which is spilling across borders into the entire region. Immediately after the February 2021 military coup, we redirected over $40 million away from programs benefiting the government to support programs benefiting civil society and the people themselves. Since then, the United States has become the largest single country donor addressing the crisis in Burma, providing nearly $1 billion US dollars in life-saving humanitarian assistance for vulnerable communities in Burma and those who have sought refuge in neighboring countries. We also remain focused on addressing the acute hardship of displaced Rohingya refugees who remain unable to safely return to their homeland, as well as those in Rakhine State who continue to suffer from the military's repression. Since 2017, the United States has provided nearly 2.1 billion US dollars to assist those affected by the crisis in Burma, Bangladesh, and elsewhere in the region. This includes the March 8th announcement of nearly 26 million US dollars in additional funding for Rohingya refugees in Bangladesh and other communities hosting refugees from Burma. We continue to work with the Bangladesh government and other Rohingya hosting governments to improve the conditions in those for, in camps for the displaced. We are also working to significantly increase resettlement of Rohingya refugees from the re region, including from Bangladesh, so that they can rebuild their lives in the United States. Finally, we are also engaged in clear, meaningful dialogue with Burma's pro-democracy movement. This engagement acknowledges the will of the people of Burma and not the will of a handful of military leaders and those who benefit from them. This line of effort is particularly important considering the regime's plan to hold sham elections. Any election without the participation of Burma's people, including the national unity government, religious groups, would represent a naked attempt by the regime to cling to power. We are also urging all partners, including in the region, to refrain from endorsing regime-led elections. With so many figures, political figures still imprisoned, we also fear that regime-led elections would only further inflame instability in Burma and the region. 
Authoritarian, authoritarianism under the guise of, quote, democracy only leads to more instability. This means engaging in dialogue with and elevating the profile of key demo pro-democracy actors in Burma as they work for a future democratic Burma. Under Secretary Zaya and Assistant Secretary Crinton Brink visited the National Unity Government offices in Washington this month, and these are recent examples of this effort. They were able to speak with pro-democracy leaders as well as representatives from ethnic communities and religious actors about their efforts to build bridges across Burma's historically deep-seated ethnic, religious, and social divisions. My colleagues and I learned about their efforts to engender cohesion, unity, and a shared vision for an inclusive federal democracy in Burma and a roadmap for achieving it. We also stress the importance of protecting the rights of Rohingya and other ethnic and religious minority groups in Burma. We recognize much work remains to be done. We welcome the US Congress's landmark Burma Act, which has given the US government new authorities and tools to expand our support to those striving for democracy in Burma. We will continue to explore a range of options to provide assistance to the pro-democracy movement. We regularly press our partners to follow our lead as we seek to deepen our support. And we're looking forward to working with many of you gathered here, as well as with Congress, in implementing some of these new authorities in the coming year. But let me be clear, these efforts are still not enough. Over 17 million people in Burma are currently in need of humanitarian assistance. The military's bloodshed continues to destroy the lives of families around the country and put a peaceful resolution to this crisis further out of reach. This is a human rights tragedy for the people of Burma as well as the international community. The regime's atrocities are destabilizing the entire Indo-Pacific region. Refugee boats are stranded and in distress at sea. Illegal drug production is surging and arms and human trafficking and people smuggling are fueling criminal networks in the region. As our Indo-Pacific strategy makes clear, we must work to achieve a free and open Indo-Pacific that is more connected, prosperous, secure, and resilient. We are under no illusions that democracy will be established in Burma overnight, or that there is any silver bullet to end the regime's reign of terror. Nevertheless, the people of Burma and those who support them like, these gathered, like those gathered here today, give us tremendous hope that the establishment of a future democratic and inclusive Burma where the human rights of all are protected is possible. Thank you again to the organizers of this panel for the invitation, and I wish you a good and productive discussion over the course of today. And I'd like to now turn to Christina Fink, our moderator for the panel. Christina, over to you. Thank you. Thank you again, Assistant, uh, uh, sorry, Acting Assistant Secretary Barkley for your important comments. Um, before we turn to our panel, we're going to have video presentations by representatives of four ethnic groups in Myanmar, Chin, Kareni, Karen, and Kachin. And each of them will be speaking about the situation in their area of the country, as well as what their organizations are doing to promote peace and democracy. Their names are as follows. The first is Chin, Dr. Kenton Lin. The second, Kareni, Aung San Yen. The third, Karen, Nimrod Andrew. And the fourth is Kachin, Nangra Zakung. And each of them will speak for about five minutes, um, after which we will turn to our panel discussion. So if we could start the presentations, please. Hello. My name is Dr. Kenton. I'm a presidium member of the ICNCC, which is known as Interim Chin Consultative Council. Our council is a political platform of Chin ethnic, ethnic people in the Spring Revolution that consists of four groups, which are elected Chin MPs, CSO CDM team, political parties in Chin State, and the CNF as an ethnic resistance organization. As you may be aware, since the military coup in February 2021, there have been several military crackdowns against the pro-democracy movement, resulting in the deaths of 3,154 people as of today. Additionally, around 16,000 people are currently under detention and 17.6 million people are in dire need of humanitarian support with 1.6 million people internally displaced. 
Due to the military's offensive attacks and continuous airstrike in Qin State, around 100,000 Qin IDPs have been forced to flee to India and other parts of the country. 1,900 houses have been burned and destroyed. On February 2, 2023, one day after the second anniversary of the military coup, the SAC declared martial law in 37 townships across the country. As a result, eight out of nine townships in Qin State are now under the direct control of military. However, despite all of these difficulties, the Qin Defense Forces, the People Defense Forces, and all the revolution forces are working hand in hand to fight for freedom and justice. As a result of their efforts, the People's Administration Boards have successfully controlled and administered 70% of the Qin State territory. One of the main objectives of the Spring Revolution is to achieve political system change and adopt civilian control over the military. This is different from merely a regime change. It is believed that the only political system change will solve the country's prolonged war. As the solutions and strategies that have been initiated, implemented, installed, and activated in the country by different means and policies for many decades have failed. To achieve this political system change, there are two solutions. First, transform the military into professional armed force under civilian control. Second, implementation of federal democracy in Myanmar. The Spring Revolution and its objectives need to be supported by international community to achieve authentic peace and security. Therefore, I respectfully request that all available channels, tools, and ways be utilized to take the strongest possible actions to help build federal democracy in our country. This is a once and for all effort revolution that is imperative and necessary. We will never forget any contributions and assistance provided for the democracy movement in Myanmar. Thank you. What I can say that democracies and human rights have been eroded in Green State since the military seeks country power on 1st February 20, uh, 2021. Since the military coup the Korean people protect non-violently against the military coup, but the terrorist bombing army unjustly arrested the people, officials, and because of the killings, all the state generation of young people who are future leaders, they have no choice in holding their arms and fighting back to SAC. Anyway, in Korean state, SAC legislative administrative and judiciary setup and power are become out of action. The revolutionary forces have been able to control more than 75% of territories of Greenland. That is, that is why the military council is trying to regain control of the place uh, with a large number of military forces. The Green State uh, Consolidated Council was established on April 9, 2021, and we practically implement ad administration and judiciary for more than two years already. In the KCC is imposed of uh, five core groups, groups in Green State, and including members from ethnic armed groups in Green State, Representative from political parties, elected members in general election in 2020, youth civil society organization and strike committee, members from women groups, they are working together to reach our political goal for future Green State. In addition, in order to implement KSCC, implement activities and uh, more effectively, KSCC was uh, reorganized and his and conference from January 17 to 20, 2023. 
The in interim arrangement for our green state also drafted and approved at the conference. The interim is a duty council of green state has also started to establish. As for the judiciary process, we have been doing cooperation uh, from before and now, but we just need to review and develop. We are currently working based on an interim arrangement, and we also draft a constitution for the transition periods and future fair state structure. However, due to political change, there are things that need to be updated. Uh, these are all uh, all our KSCC activities and current situation in Green State. We have found the Green State Consolidated Council together with the stakeholder in the Green State to carry out state administration and judiciary works. Moreover, we make political cooperation with the National Unity Government, National Unity Consolidated Council. We also send Green State representatives to the NUTA and UCC to work in together for the Future Fair Democracy Union in Myanmar. We also cooperation with other ethnic armed um, resistant organizations, state representative council, uh, political parties and civil society organization. We are regularly share our activities and implementation project with other state councils, ethnic organization for building fair democracy unions in Myanmar. We conduct virtual meetings and sometimes in, in person. This is our cooperation with stakeholders in and out of uh, the Green State. So what I would like to demand and encourage one thing to international community that international cooperation is important in order to take action against the SEC, arbitrary treatments, abuse of powers, and the crimes against humanity committed against the people in Myanmar as well as in Green State. Thank you very much. Thank you so much um, for um, giving the opportunity for me to speak um, today. My name is Son Nimrod. I'm from the Korean National Union Foreign Department. And I'm very honored to uh, to share with you our perspective on the current situation in Burma, especially when we look at the the situation in uh, Myanmar. Um, we, uh, we could say that um, how uh, peace and uh, democracy is important in in Korean on in the Korean state on in the whole Myanmar, and I think uh, this is a very good question because when you look at the current uh, military coup, because of the upset of the democracy, um, the violence has been spread all over the country, and um, in our experience, Korean people have been suffering under the military rule for so many years. And we lost all the basis right and freedom, and um, and um, because of the uh, military authorization, who with uh one against our own people, um, this suffering, this violence have been going on for decades after decades, and this military coup also really reinforced why uh, democracy is important to the people, and and to the community because of the military rule, because of the military attack and authoritarian rules. Uh, in terms of ending the military rule or military violence um, in, in, in Myanmar, uh, KNU and the Korean people are working closely and fostering the alliance relationship with our ethnic people, as well as uh, with the pro-democracy movement, because we know that it is important. It is, it is uh, important that to work together and to be united to fight against our common enemy, a military dictatorship, uh, to remove the military dictatorship and bring back a federal democratic uh, system to, to Myanmar. And in that, we are working closely with our alliance, as you might heard the, the K3C, for example, the Korean, Korean, Kachin, and Chin, and um, on the political issue, as well as a military matter coordinations. And also we are working with, um, we have alliance relationship with the 
uh, uh, national unity government, and um, we work on many uh, issues. And especially we see that um, we also coordinate the military uh, um, coordination. For example, you might heard about the K3C, uh, sorry, uh, J2C, uh, Joint Command and Control. And this is not only to to fight against the military dictatorship, but it's also in a way of building a future system, a future and better pro professional um, um, arm system that would be a model for our future federal democratic system. So it is important to have the kind of coordination. This is important to work together. And by working together, uh, having a united um, uh, front, we believe that we'll be able to to remove the military rule and bring back the democracy and, federal, uh, and, and rebuild a federal system in Myanmar in the near future. The inspiration of building a future federal democratic system is not only from the top down, but also from the bottom up. And um, and Korean, especially the Korean people, have been um, practicing some kind of uh, democracy or some kind of federal system in our own territory. Because in uh, Kianyu area, we have um, uh, uh, we have several districts, and those several districts have their own uh, local governments and and all of their work coordinated together. And uh, now it is important that to strengthen uh, this uh, local government mechanism system. And we know that um, uh, we need a lot of uh, uh, support. We need a lot of resources. But at the same time, we already have this system in place. For example, we have a health system, education system, and uh, the rule of law and legal system. Um, this local government and administration is important because this is how the, the, the federal system work. And this is how it's inspired to, to, to build this local government, to strengthen it. And if we can build that and strengthen that, then when uh, we, we, we introduce or when we have a chance to implement or practice a federal democratic system, this system can integrate into the the broader federal democratic democratic system that we are inspired of. So this is important message that we want to share with you that um, in in Korean or uh, in KNU administrative control area, we already have uh, a, a, a basic system that uh, we are practicing for decades. Thank you. Good morning, distinguished guests, ladies and gentlemen. I'm honored for getting this opportunity to share my perspectives in this panel with the theme, Democracy as a Pathway to Peace in Burma. This theme is extremely valid and timely for Burma today. Let me begin by recalling the, the early days of 2021. Burma was just about to experience the, the third term of the democratically elected government. People and civil society organizations were excited to continue supporting the ongoing peace building and state building works. Young people in all over the country have been excited, planning to implement the national youth policy approved by the NLD government. There was so much hope and excitement for better peace, good governance and development through the Myanmar Sustainable Development Plan, which was started in 2018 to 2030. However, the coup on February 1st, 2021 attempted to wash away almost everything. International community has witnessed what we have been going through within past 25 months. People of Burma don't deserve at all. Here, I would like to highlight some points on where we are. Firstly, amidst all odds and challenges, we don't give up and we don't give up at least for, we won't give up for at least three reasons. Number one, because the people of Burma has tasted the essence of democracy for about 10 years, they want to get back what was robbed by the military. Myanmar people of all walks of life have been in the movement in whatever possible ways, wherever they are. Number two, because this is the best time ever to restore peace as 
all the people, including the Ma majority, have seen the dark side of the military, that common enemy of peace and democracy became crystal clear. Number three, because the youth dare to dream for the new nation with new set of values as promulgated in the Federal Democracy Charter on 31st March of 2021. Secondly, it has been two years this month that the National Unity Consultative Council was formed with broad spectrum of pro-democracy forces such as CRPH, political parties, ethnic resistant organizations, strike committees, unions, civil society organizations, including youth and women. This broad coalition or alliance, if you like, holds deliberative dialogues on the current policy issues and future nation building agenda. Yes, we have challenges given the diverse backgrounds and distinctive organization cultures of which we came from. However, we all value this platform in which we built understanding and trust for the aspiration of future new union. Thirdly, to build peace in multi-ethnic country like Burma with intractable conflict for decades, it is needed to maintain and strengthen such valuable venue in order for holding further healthy dialogues among the pro-democracy forces for peaceful future. Finally, I would like to conclude that building peace in Burma as we see it in the world map right now means rebuilding a new nation, Federal Democratic Union, because only peace values can be the connectors of the diverse peoples into a well-woven pluralistic society or nation. There is no other way as I see it. We need multi-sectoral support from world democracies such as United States and others for current phase and new future in rebuilding the new nation. Thank you very much. I want to thank all of our speakers who were so generous in giving their time coming from resistance areas in Myanmar to make those presentations to us today. And their speeches really highlight some things that I think we don't always see from the outside. From the outside, we see what the military is doing. We see there's this vast array of resistance forces operating in the country, but it doesn't seem to necessarily come together. We just see this picture of violence. But what our speakers highlighted is the degree to which people from all walks of life have come together, whether they're civilians, whether they're members of political parties, whether they're members of armed resistance forces, across ethnicities, they are working together to try to restore democracy. And why is that? Because they've realized that only through democracy can peace, stability, and development be brought to the country. And I think two phrases that came up in those presentations were democracy from below and federalism from below. And that's what we're really seeing, although it can be invisible from the outside, but we got a taste of it from our speakers, that these experiments, these dialogues, these consultative bodies are working together to implement this here and now, as well as to design frameworks for a better future in Myanmar. So with that, I'd like to turn to our panel discussion, and I'm going to introduce each of our panelists in turn, and then we'll begin our discussion. So first, I'd like to introduce Mo Zhao He is the Deputy Foreign Affairs Minister from the National Unity Government, and he's also the former Chief of Staff to Aung San Suu Kyi. And then on the screen, we have retired Ambassador Scott Marcial, who served as both the ambassador to Burma or Myanmar, as well as the ambassador to Indonesia. And then we have Johanna Kao, uh, furthest to the left, who is from the International Republican Institute and serves as the Asia Regional Director. So Mo Zhao, let's start with you. I'd like to ask you to talk a little bit about your perspective on the resistance movement, its purpose, its challenges, and its achievements to date. Uh, thank you, Christina, for the introduction. And thank you, the USIP, for giving me this 
very good chance to talk about our resistance. So, uh, like uh, Siaman Nero recently said, uh, our country is a multi-ethnic society. So, ethnic nationalities, uh, uh, which used to have been independent entities uh, in our country for a long time in the, in the history, uh, after the war, were decided to seek independence together with the Bama majority, Bama majority people, uh, and then they uh, decided to build a federal union with the Bama majority. So, uh, but after the independence, the uh, subsequent constitutions such as the 1947, 1974, or 2008 constitutions failed to fulfill the promises uh, described, specified in the Penlong Agreement. Penlong Agreement, which is our founding accord of, uh, of the union among different uh, ethnic nationalities. Uh, that became a reason and cause for our very long, prolonged, more than 60, 70 year long civil war. So, uh, I, after 1962, after the military coup in 1962 and subsequent military coups, uh, the democracy just disappeared in our country together with the multi-party system and the federalism. So in that place, the military dictatorship came in. And that's the reason why uh, there are uh, a lot of problems in our country uh, as, as a consequence of the lack of both democracy as well as federal system. So I would like to say that this is a very good time for our country, for us, uh, to redeem the promises like the democracy, equality, or self-determination, the rights specified in the Penal Agreement. Uh, so uh, uh, the Spring Revolution, what we call the current re revolution, has been a very good opportunity uh, for us to address these a problem like the eradication of the military dictatorship and establishment of the federal union. So, uh, yes, of course, we need a collaboration among different elements. Uh, that has been resisting uh, the military counter and that has been uh, trying to establish a federal union. Uh, but I would like to say that very good news is that we have a unity in purpose. Uh, because uh, we could establish, after the, spring, uh, after the attempted coup, we could establish a platform, what we call the National Unity Consultative Council, in which we could discuss a lot of things, including the fundamental principles for our future union. So uh, we stipulated these fundamental principles in our Federal Democracy Charter. So I wanted to say uh, very proudly that the most important uh, achievement of this uh, current spring revolution is uh, the, federal, the product, the Federal Democracy Charter. Uh, because all the elements that has been resisting the military dictatorship agreed and endorsed the Federal Democracy Charter. But of course, there are a lot of other groups that have yet to ratify uh, the De uh, Federal Democracy Charter, uh, because uh, when uh, people talk about the unity, uh, people always complain about the differences, like the, in terms of different uh, uh, political uh, differences in political affiliations, or, or differences in our ethnicities or our civil entities, or things like that. But we already have the unity in our purpose. Uh, for example, very recently, uh, uh, the seven groups in northern part of the country, uh, what they call themselves as FPNCC, Federal uh, Political Negotiating and Consultation Committee, FPNCC, uh, released a statement on March 16. In that statement, they said that uh, uh, they agreed an idea of establishment of the uh, federal, uh, federal Democratic Union in cooperation with the Bama Bima, Bama Bima, Bama Prabha, the majority of Bama's people. So the 
have yet to ratify the Federal Democracy Charter, but they agreed on the very essence of the Federal Democracy Charter, which is to establish a Federal Democratic Union. So, so I would like to say that the only group, the only entity that has been resisting the idea of establishment of the Federal Democracy Union is the military regime itself. Uh, because in their uh, constitution, 2000 constitution that they have drafted, uh, I would say that the 2000 constitution fall far short of uh, two aspects uh, of our, uh, uh, that we need to address, which is uh, uh, the one is democracy, another one is the federal system. So uh, I would say that the majority are more concerned with the uh, the principles uh, for the democracy, and then um, the ethnic, major, uh, ethnic minor, minorities and ethnic groups are more concerned with the uh, federal system. Anyway, we all need both systems at the same time in our country. In our country, so uh, we have a purpose. We have a unity of purpose, and then we all agree to est establish a federal democratic union. It's so only in that way that we will be able to solve the problems, the crisis in our uh, country. So, uh, of course, we uh, need peace, stability, and security to uh, bring about some developments and prosperity to our country. But without democracy, without federal system, I think it would uh, not happen. In a, we, we will not be able to achieve that goal as well. So this is our baseline, that is our red line as well. So we cannot compromise on it. We cannot compromise on it. So our people are determined uh, to continue our revolution, no matter what, despite, very, uh, despite their hardships and brutalities of the military and atrocities of the military being committed uh, by the military right now. So, of course, we need assistance from the international communities. So first of all, the international community uh, should effectively support uh, the pro-democracy and pro-federal system groups in our country, effectively and substantively in a coordinated manner. So that I would say that, for example, the international community should not lend any legitimacy or the recognition to the military hunter at all. So, uh, that includes uh, some sort of the uh, uh, legitimacy of the military hunter, like uh, their attempt to hold so-called sham elections. Uh, another thing is that the international community should put more pressures, uh, effective uh, pressure, pressures on the military hunter. Uh, uh, because as long as the military has uh, their own survival lifeline, uh, they will continue their uh, uh, dominance in politics of our country. So we need to cut uh, the income flowing into the coffer of the military counter, which is very important. The most important uh, income that we need to cut is uh, the revenues from the uh, MOGE, Myanmar, oil and gas enterprise. So another, the, the last thing is that uh, we understand that in the international community uh, has been trying to help solve the crisis and problem in our country. So we understand that when they do that, we would like the international community focus on the root causes of the country, which is eradication of the military dictatorship, the dominance of the military in our politics, and the establishment of the Federal Union. So uh, sometimes, uh, for example, a call for a dialogue uh, without any substantive political agenda to address these root causes and without any conducive environment for that uh, dialogue, I would say that it would not help at all. It would even make the situation more confusing and more deteriorating. So anyway, we, the people of our country are pretty much determined to continue our uh, revolution, to continue our uh, struggle. So we need 
the assistance of the international community. So the message I would like to give is that please don't allow the military to win in our country. Please allow us to win. Thank you very much. Thank you for that, Mozou. So uh, Ambassador Marcial, Mozou has just said to the international community, please don't allow the military to win, allow us to win. What is the position of Southeast Asian nations on the situation in Myanmar? And uh, if you could also talk a little bit about international uh, actions more broadly. Thank you. Yeah, um, thank you, Christina, and thanks uh, USIP for organizing this event. Um, Overall, the international community's response to, to this attempted coup by the military and, and the attempt to turn back the clock in Myanmar has been pretty disappointing. Um, you've got, um, on the one hand, the countries that, like China, India, along with Russia, and I'll focus on countries in the region, um, just very clearly supporting the junta. Um, and obviously I can't speak for those governments, but I'll give you my thoughts on, on why. Um, China, my guess is, is probably not, was probably not thrilled with the coup, but they will work with whoever holds power in the capital of Naypyidaw. So they're providing arms, diplomatic support, and also pushing the ethnic resistance organizations near China to strike a deal with the military, which would be a disaster. They're also, by the way, pushing Rohingya repatriation uh, when there are conditions for Rohingya repatriation are absolutely not there. Um, this reflects a very cynical Beijing approach. They don't really care about the Chinese government doesn't care about the Myanmar people's views. They don't really want, in my view, a strong and successful Myanmar. They prefer a weak, fractious one uh, with just enough stability. Um, one last point is that uh, I'm concerned that Beijing increasingly seems to be looking at Myanmar as a U.S.-China issue and worrying more about whether they might lose influence to the U.S. And this is really unfortunate because it's not a U.S.-China issue. There's no reason for it to be. This is a Myanmar issue. Um, and I would just point out that any government that emerges in Myanmar in the future will need to have good relations with uh, with China, and that should not be a concern for the United States. Um, I want to talk too about India, which isn't talked about enough, um, also being supportive of the junta, probably for two reasons. One, concern about losing influence to China, and two, feeling it needs to cooperate with the junta on border issues, including small insurgency groups that operate near the border. I'm guessing they also just assume that the military will win. Uh, which is a very questionable assumption. My view, again, this is a cynical approach that's also short-sighted. If and when the resistance wins, um, uh, the, the new government will have to have good ties with China, but I'm not sure it's so important for them to have such good ties with India, because India, frankly, is less important. Uh, I'm not saying any new government would be hostile to India, but I think there will be some price that India will pay for its support. Uh, for the uh, junta. And if India is worried about Chinese influence, the best thing would be to work for a strong and unified and successful Myanmar. And you're not going to get that with the junta. Um, ASEAN. Um, ASEAN's tried and has done some positive things, uh, such as not inviting the junta uh, leadership to come to summits and, and those sorts of things and, and issuing some good statements. And they also came up with this five-point consensus almost two years ago. Um, but that consensus was stillborn. Um, the generals in de facto rejected it. And it didn't really fit the realities of Myanmar. Um, it was based, in my view, on the false assumption that the generals could be reasoned with and that they cared about the country. Um, neither of those assumptions uh, is true, in my view. And my sense is that many in ASEAN understand that this five-point consensus isn't going in anywhere, but they continue to hold it out because since ASEAN is divided, they can't gain consensus on a new or bolder approach. <laughs> Excuse me. I have to say uh, our friends, uh, the Thai government, has been pretty unhelpful. Uh, they're clearly supporting the junta, um, it, although they are... Um, quietly doing a few positive things, but basically supporting the junta. Others in ASEAN are hiding behind the ASEAN don't interfere in domestic affairs concept. 
Um, my view is any engagement with the junta is interfering in Myanmar's internal affairs since it has no legitimacy. Others in ASEAN would like to do more, but they can't get the, the broad support. Um, Indonesia's chairmanship is certainly an opportunity. Indonesia has been, uh, A, as a democracy, and B, has been more outspoken and critical of the coup and more supportive of uh, the people of Myanmar. But we have to see what Indonesia is going to do. Um, ideally, there will be more engagement by Indonesia and others in ASEAN with the NUG and ethnic resistance groups, uh, so-called mini-lateralism, perhaps, if not all of ASEAN can get behind. I hope Indonesia will also push particularly Thailand to be more open to allowing humanitarian assistance uh, to come in. But again, we have to see. My sense is that um, for ASEAN and all the neighbors, kind of underlying this, these positions has been a belief that, as I said earlier, that A, the generals can be reasoned with, and that there is some possibility of a negotiated compromise deal um, between the military and the resistance under which the military would maintain lots of power. And I think, again, there's this underlying sense that the military is an essential institution and that there's no possibility of dramatically restructuring it. Some see the military as inevitable or even essential. I don't think that's true. And for those who know the history of Myanmar, you know that the military over the last 60 years has really driven the country down consistently in every respect and created conflict. The SAC, the, the, the junta regime, is the, is the worst regime in the region since the Khmer Rouge. It has no support, it's incapable of running the country, and it's absolutely despised by the Myanmar people. Um, you've got massive conflict, displacement, refugee flows, increased criminal activity, which should concern the region. Um, with a wink and a nod from the military, this has been going on, including narcotics, spreading, growing, huge problem. And you have a prospect of instability continuing and further decline of Myanmar. So there is no positive way forward with this military junta. Um, and again, countries in the region need to understand the SAC can't restore stability, it can't govern the country, nor will the population accept its continued power. And there is no, in my view, at this point, there is no compromise deal to be had that allows the military to maintain power. First, the military is not interested at all at this point in compromise. And as the Deputy Foreign Minister just said, um, the Deputy Foreign Minister of the NUG just said, uh, people, uh, resistance is not going to compromise if it means allowing the military to stay in power or not achieving the goals of a democratic federal union. So it's not helpful at this time to support unrealistic uh, compromise deal. Um, the, there is also, I think, a concern and doubt about the broad resistance's ability to A, win, and B, to succeed in unifying the country. And I understand those concerns. But what I think people need to understand is A, how much work is being done, as we've just heard, by the various elements of the resistance to, to overcome the decades of mistrust and build collaboration and cooperation. Um, but also that the resistance is really the only hope for a successful Myanmar. We, with, the, with the junta, there is zero hope. With the resistance, there's no guarantees, but there's a lot of hope and there's an opportunity and the world should get behind it. The goal should be to weaken the junta to the point that it seeks a way out and at the same time support the democratic forces build their governance capacity and build cohesion. I'll stop there. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, Johanna, I'd like to turn to you. So the International Republican Institute has long been involved in supporting democracy and human rights in Myanmar. Could you talk a little bit about what you think the United States could do what needs to be done to strengthen the movement from outside. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Christina, and, and thank you for, for, for having us here today. Uh, you know, I think just, just briefly, I, you know, IRI, uh, we are a, a nonprofit, non governmental organization. Our, our work is supporting democratic development. We have been working on Burma for about 30 years, and we are, we are part of a family of organizations um, that do this work in support, supported by USAID, by the Department of State, and by the National Endowment for Democracy. Um, 
you know, I think just to reiterate a couple of the points that, that other speakers have made, you know, we, we are in this unprecedented time uh, in, in Burma right now. You know, we've heard about the, this collective reaction, the scale of the reaction to the military. Um, one of the big changes I think we have seen is that across the country, across ethnic groups, there is this real clear-eyedness that the obstacle to peace and stability in Burma is the military, and that's what it is. Um, one of the other big changes that we are seeing is this transformation in these transformations in society, and so particularly among Bama groups, um, you know, this this especially in re relation to ethnic groups, attitudes about the Rohingya that have changed. All of these have been incredibly positive changes that have come about. You know, when when IRI, the work we had done, working certainly inside inside Burma uh, during that that sort of almost decade, uh, when when democracy, when there was when more democracy on the ground, you know, some of the challenges that we saw to building democratic institutions were on things like inclusion, uh, on issues such as you know challenges of centralized decision making, for example. And one of the things when we look at this, the situation now in this po post-coup environment, or it, it, so since the coup has taken place, um, are very big shifts. You know, by necessity, decision making has had to become less centralized. The the ability of the national unity government, of civil society groups that are, are working in the resistance to be able to innovate, to be very creative, to be very adaptive, um, all of those strengths within within the society have really come to the fore. Um, and I, I think what we've heard from, from some of the earlier speakers about this really focused effort for more inclusion in decision making the grassroots, the sort of bottom-up effort to bring in people into decision-making about their own country. All of these things, you know, as, as Scott just said, these there are reasons for hope because these are the, the foundations of democracy, right? As we all know, democracy is an, is an act. It is, it is not a destination. Um, and so all of these changes that are taking place lay some strong foundations. Now, this, so this is a crucial time, right? It's a crucial time where two years on from the coup, um, people clearly remained very determined and very resilient. And so from the perspective of the US, you know, I, I think leaders and opposition, the opposition groups also now need to be, need to remain resilient. And I think, I believe, this is really where our role is. You know, our role is to support this resilience and support these efforts at resilience um, and to push back and to ensure that the junta is is indeed isolated and, and seeks its, its exit ramp. Um, so I think one of the ways, the main way that, that the US can do this um, is through keeping an eye on the big picture. Uh, you know, that, that we, if the, the, the goal is, a pe is peace and a free society um, and a democracy in Burma, um, there are lessons that the U.S. has learned from experiences all over the world of what transitions out of conflict look like, of what transitions to democracy look like. And so drawing on some of those lessons in order to build unity, to build, to, to focus on coalition building, um, those are the areas in which, you know, in addition to the things that, that Aaron was talking about earlier, um, those are areas of direct support that the US can offer. And I think in this, this perspective of looking at the very big picture, working with all of the actors who are working towards the restoration of democracy for Burma um, is, going to be, is going to be very important. And then thinking through what are some of those hard and soft skills that can be provided to support those efforts. And so that is in areas to continue the, this, this instinct of inclusion, working on coalition building, supporting those efforts, supporting clear communications for, so that the, those who are working, the, the institutions who are working to build, working towards democracy, are able to clearly communicate their intentions both to their own people um, and, and continue to communicate clearly to, to the international community, the efforts as you have done of, of what is needed. Thanks so much for that, Joanna. So I'm going to ask our panelists one last question. Uh, but before that, I wanted to just remind the audience you're free to put questions into the chat box online, and then we will be taking those questions. Uh, so my last question to all of you, I hope you'll all just say something, is 
Just thinking in the short term, next three months, for instance, what are one or two things that you think would be helpful for the US government or other international entities to do to uh, further uh, the democracy movement, the movement for federalism in Myanmar? So, let me so would you like to yeah. start? Uh, we need arms ammunition, we need man uh, we need javelin. I'm just kidding. Of <laughs> course, <laughs> <laughs> we need these. Uh, but uh, we understand that it is not possible for the international community to provide such lethal assistance to our country. But uh, now, uh, the time is running out. So we need some effective assistance to our movement, uh, like uh, the non-leaders, and there are a lot of non-leaders that can be provided to us. I don't want to specify, or I don't want to define what non-leader assistance are, but mm -hmm. uh, for example, we need some uh, sort of assistance for our communication system. Uh, we need some assistance for the uh, local administration and local governance, because we have some sort of controlled area inside mm. the country that we have to provide some services to uh, these areas like education for the children and healthcare, assist, uh, healthcare for the people in, in these areas. And then there are a lot of the increasing numbers of the internally displaced people because of the brutal attack on the civilians of the military. So we need some urgent assistance for these uh, people who are in need of uh, assistance immediately. So, so they have, I, I, uh, I don't, I want to say that within three months, what assistance we need, but uh, in terms of assistance, we need um, assistance for many things, for many areas at the same time. So uh, that the international community or any uh, countries or any organizations, they have their own pref preference in terms of assistance. So they could provide any assistance in our country. The most important thing is that uh, some, of the, some of the international NGOs some of, or some of the UN organizations are trying to reach out uh, to the people in our country through the UN systems inside the country. Mm. Uh, but UN country team and UN, they, they, they have been doing a great job. I accept that. But uh, they have to cooperate with the military counter to have some access to the area that they would like to provide assistance. In that case, uh, they cannot reach to us. So the most important thing is that uh, they also need to reach uh, to the people that we, uh, in, in, in the area where we could control. So they could consult with us, they could consult with the ethnic resistance uh, groups, they could consult with the local organization in these areas to, pro uh, to, uh, to, to, to provide and to deliver the assistance to these areas. This is also very important, I think. Thank you for that. So humanitarian assistance, having UN agencies work together with local organizations that are already providing this assistance on the ground in areas that are not controlled by the military, and non-lethal assistance to the resistance movement are some of the things that are very important. Right? Ambassador Merciel. Um, a couple things. Uh, one, I think the United States should increase assistance to the broad uh, pro-democracy movement. I'm out of government now, so I don't know all the details of what's already happening, but I do believe that there is more that can be done, and I think that should be uh, made a priority. Two, and this will be very hard given the state of U.S.-China relations, ideally there's some quiet conversations between U.S. and Chinese officials where the U.S. can, I think, make it very clear that it's important this not become a U.S.-China issue, and make it, I, I'd say, be very explicit that we would we support any future government that emerges, uh, democratic government. Uh, while obviously it would make its own choices, but we would support it having a good relationship with China. Um, three, I hope that Indonesia and maybe some other uh, sympathetic ASEAN governments will meet publicly with the NUG and resistance forces. I think that would send a very strong signal. And last but not least, the Secretary General of the UN, who has been really disappointing on this crisis, um, I should travel to the region, particularly to Thailand, and push harder uh, for a humanitarian assistance opening. Stop there. Thanks. Thank you. And Johanna? 
Yeah, I, I think it's sort of in, in two things in the near term. I think sort of echoing what Scott just said, um, for the US to continue its very broad consultations across all of the groups, all of the resistance groups um, that are currently in, engaged in the struggle, um, and to continue support to all of those, all of those groups um, in their efforts um, would, would be a key thing. I think in addition to that, the, uh, sort of unwavering communication by the U.S. of its support for the resistance, for the the right of the Burmese people to have their choice, have their voices heard in this in this movement towards democracy, will also be critical. I think not only to to convey to the international community, to the junta itself of, of where the U.S. stands, but also just at, to to convey clearly to the people of Burma where the U.S. stands in, in this struggle, in their struggle. Um, and I, I think the upcoming Summit for Democracy is, is a fantastic opportunity um, to, to use that platform to talk about why, why democratic values, why the, the dangers that are posed by this junta in the heart of Southeast Asia, the dangers that that poses not just to the people inside, inside Burma, um, but to the region and, and more broadly as well. Great, thanks so much. Um, so I know the questions have been coming in from online and Nicole Cochran from USIP will be reading out the questions and then we'll, some of them may be directed to specific panelists in other cases, everyone feel free to answer. Great, thank you. Um, so we've heard from representatives of ethnic armed organizations and of course the NUG um, about the work that they're doing to fight for federal democracy um, and the coordination that is involved in that. Um, what is the role of civil society and faith-based groups in this resistance? Great question. Mozo, do you want to say something about that? Yeah, I think there is a very big role uh, that the civil society in our country can play. Uh, because, uh, like I said in my remarks, that in our uh, uh, consultation process uh, in the National Unity Consultative Council, there are a lot of civil society groups participating in, in the process to discuss about different things, uh, uh, not only about the federal, uh, uh, federal fundamental principles or things like that. So especially uh, when we talk about uh, the local governance or local administration, uh, like the, the previous speaker said, uh, there is a process of bottom-up approach uh, of the of the, uh, uh, the building the f f federal union. So, it, in that area as well, there are a lot, of, a lot of things that the civil society can do, and they are still doing a lot of things as well. For example, delivering the uh, sort of the assistance or uh, capacity building, or trying to reach to the different uh, ethnic groups and women, the children groups. Uh, they are playing a lot of roles to uh, do such things. So, and not only that, but also for our future uh, federal union, I, I mean, in the post-conflict uh, uh, period, there are a lot of uh, things that the uh, civil society can do as well, uh, because we have a lot of problems uh, remained to be solved uh, in, in, in the aftermath of our conflict. So, yeah, uh, I, I would say that uh, a big role is still there for the civil society to play. If I could, I could, I could add to that, you know, I think as I was, as I was mentioning earlier, the, the adaptation and the creativity and the innovation um, that we are seeing among groups that are in, engaged in, in, in the full breadth of resistance activities has, has very much, it's all been driven from civil society. You know, I, I think in IRI's experience working uh, with Burmese opposition groups, civil society has always been the beating heart of, of ensuring that the movement just keeps renewing itself. Um, and so, you know, I, I think whether it's in the health or education sectors, or certainly when it comes to looking at the sort of the democracy and human rights space, um, civil society has been active both outside of, outside of the borders of Burma, and inside in, in, in trying to maintain morale, uh, in trying to support um, the sort of civilian defiance movements that are smaller now than they were two years ago, but, but still exist and they, they still pop up, um, which I think are important 
internal symbolic reminders uh, to everyone that the resistance is alive uh, and that the, the, the military hasn't been able to, to snuff that out. But I think as, as transition continues, another very important role of civil society will be on the accountability piece of ensuring that as the political leadership is coalescing, as um, you know, there's a move towards sort of institutions of federal democracy, um, civil society can play a role in ensuring that those promises that, that leaders are making are being upheld uh, you know, for, for, the, for their own people. Um, and so in, the, in those ways, the, 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 the foundations are very strong um, and would expect civil society to, to continue to play a very robust role. Ambassador Marcial, did you want to add anything? Uh, no, I think, I think my colleagues have covered it well. Great, okay. Great. Thank you. Um, our next question, um, Ambassador Marcial spoke about the possibility of negotiations, about the possibility of an off-ramp for the junta. Um, what conditions need to be met before negotiations between the democratic opposition forces and the military is even possible? Great question, yeah. Um, Mozo, do you want to start on that? What would be the conditions that would need to be met before negotiations could happen? genuine negotiations that might go somewhere? Uh, the first of all, I wanted to say that uh, we cannot compromise on the eradication of the military dictatorship, which is the dominance of the military in our politics. So we don't need that at all. And then we need to uh, abolish the two-nominate constitution. And then we need to uh, establish a new uh, federal union, and we need to draft a new constitution, new federal democratic constitution for our country, which is uh, the red line that we cannot cross. Mm -hmm. And then there is uh, the baseline that we cannot compromise on. So uh, I think it is not a good time for us to talk about the negotiations of things like that, because, uh, uh, because we knew very well about the mentality of the, uh, the military. They are always trying to take advantage of uh, the sort of the so-called negotiation or the dialogue or whatever it is for their benefit, for their political benefit. Mm. They have used uh, that kind of tactic in the, in the history so many times. Mm. So they are always trying to manipulate that kind of process for their benefit. So. When it comes to the negotiation or the dialogue or something like so, uh, we need to uh, very carefully need to address the root causes of the country first. And then uh, we need to know the fact that the military, military will not give up any, uh, uh, even part of their power uh, their, uh, to, to, to the, to the, back to the people mm. unless uh, they are precious enough to do so. That is a f very fact that we need to be take. Uh, we need to take care of. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks, um, Ambassador Marcial. Would you like to say anything here? Yeah, I, I don't want to offer any ideas on what the conditions should be because I think that's up to the the resistance and pe people of Myanmar, not not foreigners. But I think my, my main point is that there's been an effort by some of the international community, maybe well-intentioned, I'm, I'm sure it's well-intentioned, that, well, to encourage this dialogue as if the problem in Myanmar is that we just need to get the people in the room together to talk. Mm -hmm. That's not the problem. Mm -hmm. The problem, as the Deputy Foreign Minister just said, is that this military has been a cancer in the society for 60 years and they want to hold on to power and they don't care how many people they have to kill to do it. So they have to be, you know, um, the, the military as it currently exists um, has to go and be, be replaced with something uh, that, that works for the Myanmar people. My point on off-ramp is that I don't see any possibility of useful dialogue or negotiations until and unless the junta is weakened to the point that it is rather desperately looking for a way out. Sure. And then perhaps there is an opportunity. Mm -hmm. right. Thank you for that. Um, let's go on to the next question. Thank you. 
Um, so the junta has attempted to feign legitimacy with these sham elections. Um, how might ASEAN or other actors in the international space respond if those elections were to occur? Yeah. Ambassador Marcial, that might be a question for you. How do you think well, in, would inevitably, some countries um, will accept the elections if they happen. Uh, no matter, and I hesitate to even call them elections because they're so far from that. But mm -hmm. they would be so far from that. But if they happen, I would imagine there'll be some countries that will that will say, "Hey, this is a step forward," um, and they would do so knowing full well that it's not a step forward. But you know, governments sometimes act pretty cynically. Um, I would hope that ASEAN as a whole would see that such sham elections actually will make the situation worse, enhance or increase violence and instability, and do nothing positive. So I think it's really important that ASEAN, at least Indonesia as the chair, make it clear ahead of time that they would not accept elections organized uh, by, by the military. Um, but it's, it's a concern because there are always some governments that that are willing to, to go along with these things. All right. Thank you. Okay, I think this is a question for Minister Moza'u. Um, could you please explain the NUG's position on the Rohingya crisis um, and the current, um, the NUG's position on the junta's stance on repatriation? Uh, first of all, we already released a position on the Rohingya people uh, in 2021. And then in that uh, policy statement, we clearly expressed our uh, policies and our way forward uh, in terms of uh, the repatriation of the refugees back to uh, the places where they belonged. And then uh, the accountability justice issues and uh, the citizenship issues as well, and some other issues like the future uh, social cohesion and uh, coexistence between different ethnic groups in, uh, in, in, in Rakhine states or things like that, and development factors as well. So in terms of uh, the repatriation of uh, the, uh, the Rohingya refugees now taking shelters in Bangladesh, uh, I would say that it is very important. It, uh, it should be the voluntary, it should be the voluntary re repatriation. Uh, it must be, uh, the process must be consulted with the, the Rohingya people, r r Rohingya refugees uh, taking shelter in Bangladesh. And then they need to be informed very well what is going on the other uh, side of the Naf uh, River, where they are going back to. So all of this information needs to be uh, provided, and then uh, the consultation process uh, with the refugee should be uh, uh, transparent. And then, uh, uh, and then I, I would I would like to say it, it should be a safe, uh, voluntary, and dignified return to the country. But I would like to uh, warn that. Uh, in our country, there are a lot of a lot of the atrocities and brutal brutalities and crimes uh, committed by the military state going on. So it is not a conducive uh, situation uh, for the refugees. Not only the uh, refu uh, refugees taking shelter in Bangladesh, uh, but also for some other. Uh, refugees taking shelter in some other countries as well. So, yeah, uh, that sort of things should be uh, taken note uh, very well. Yeah, there are many Rohingya in Malaysia, Indonesia, Thailand, etc., as well, who need to be taken care of, right? Sure. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. Next question um, relates to the role of non-democratic countries like Russia and China. Um, could you elaborate more about um, their role in or positions on the conflict in Myanmar, particularly in light of um, the recent visit of Xi Jinping to Russia? Yeah, Ambassador Marcial, you talked about that a little already, but maybe you'd like to say a few more words, particularly about Russia. 
Yeah, I mean, Russia hasn't had a lot of influence in Myanmar um, in in recent history, uh, but you know they they embraced the coup almost immediately, sent delegations down. I think again, I'm not a Russia expert, and I, I obviously can't can't you know get inside the head of um, uh, Russian leadership. But um, a, it's an opportunity to sell weapons. Uh, B, it's an opportunity to try to enhance um, uh, their um, their relationship and, and their standing in Southeast Asia. C, at a time maybe when they don't have a lot of friends, it's an opportunity to have um, a friend, even if I'm not sure that having the SAC as a friend is all that helpful. And fourth, I think it's a it's an opportunity to create instability and to sort of, you know, uh, be anti-democratic. I'm not sure that has a lot to do with their relationship with China. I think China's interests are very different and much more uh, substantive than Russia's. Uh, Mozo, would you like to talk about China and you know how, what's the stance of the NUG and China's relationship with Myanmar and NUG interaction, if you're able to talk about that with China? Thank you. Uh, yeah, China is... Uh, our neighbor, and not only not only China, uh, we have some other neighbors as well. So uh, it is not possible for us to move away from that that place to another. Uh, so we would like to have a very good relationship with the uh, neighbor with our neighboring countries, which is uh, very important. Uh, for example, for China, uh, we have a lot of investments and businesses of China in our country. Uh, so. Uh, we don't have uh, any intention to uh, have bad impact on these uh, businesses or these, uh, the investments of uh, not only China, but also some other neighboring countries as well. So, uh, but uh, we need stability, we need security, and we need peace in our country for our neighboring country to continue their businesses and uh, their investments uh, uh, in, in, in our country. So. In order to uh, maintain that stability and uh, security in our country, we need a stable uh, country, a stable government, and stable governance in, uh, in the country. So uh, that is the reason why we are trying to uh, establish a federal democratic union. And that is the reason why we are trying to eradicate the dominance of the military in our country so that we will be able to uh, uh, establish a country that can gar guarantee very well the investments, investments and business of other countries, including China. Okay, thanks. Next question. All right, perhaps the last question. Probably, yes. Um, could you elaborate a bit more on the types of assistance um, that the U.S. could potentially provide to pro-democracy actors in Burma? Right, so this is something we've talked about a little bit already, but there's always more to say on this topic, so this is a chance to say whatever else you haven't said. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, I think the, the, the assistance that has been provided um, is, in, is a number of different forms in, to the pro-democracy movement. I mean, the first is consultation, right? It's ensuring that there is outreach to a broad range of actors who are engaged in the resistance movement and ensuring that we in the US, that the US government and all of the, the sort of American stakeholders that we are listening to what they are saying and, and understanding their priorities and their needs and responding to those. Um, the nature of that assistance is through support, technical assistance, um, it might be training opportunities, it might be leveraging, as I was referring to earlier, the experience of implementers like IRI in working on democratic and post-conflict transitions around the world to be able to offer um, comparative experience and lessons learned to our friends and to our partners who are engaged in this struggle to help them think about the hard and soft skills that need to be built, but also to help them keep an eye on the path that they're trying to take um, and, and provide support to that. Uh, uh, like I said before, we uh, need uh, assist assistance for our revolution, which is the most important thing f uh, f uh, for us for, uh, for the time being. And then at the same time, we need some assistance for 
the process of building a, uh, uh, the bottom-up approach of the establishing our federal system as well, because we are not exercising our federal systems. Uh, right now in the revolution, revolutionary period, because uh, we have, for example, uh, trying to provide some uh, uh, health care services to the people uh, in different areas. In that case, we are cooperating with the ethnic groups, uh, because ethnic resistance groups uh, have their own network of uh, the, uh, uh, the health care uh, providing systems and things like that. So we are cooperating with the ethnic groups and not only for the healthcare, but also for the education and some other things as well. So we work in together with them, uh, trying to exercise a, a federal system in the very beginning of our, re our revolution. So we also need uh, that kind of assistance, and then we also uh, need to uh, cooperate with, the, with all different uh, groups. So uh, like I said, uh, for the post-conflict, uh, uh, period, we, we need some, uh, we, we also need some other things, like for example, the demining process, it is not, not only for the post-conflict mm. conflict period, but also uh, we, well, we need now as well, uh, the demining, we uh, need to spend a lot of money, a lot of technology, assist, uh, technical assistance or things like that, uh, to demine in some areas as well, so that the people who have been displaced will be able to return to their place safely or things like that. This is just an, an example. Yeah. yeah, there's been tremendous use of landmines to prevent people from being able to come back to their own communities, and uh, that is a very serious problem. Thank you for raising that. Um, Ambassador Marcial, we haven't talked about Japan, we haven't talked about the EU, other countries. Is there anything the U.S. can do to uh, get them more engaged or to work together collectively in maybe 30 seconds? Um, yeah, I mean, I think there's pretty good uh, discussion with Japan and the EU. Japan is still not quite where I think it should be on this issue, but um, I think going forward on assistance to tie it all together, the U.S., Japan, EU, others uh, should be uh, working uh, to support the local governance initiatives, absolutely. Um, and also looking ahead, as the Deputy Foreign Minister said, to a post-crisis situation, thinking about with the World Bank an economic recovery program, a massive humanitarian assistance program, obviously the, the demining, these are things that the Europeans, Japanese and others, Australia, Korea, uh, can all contribute to. Um, and at the same time, just taking and continuing to take a very firm line, not getting tempted into, you know, engaging with the, the generals um, in any way. Uh, so, because there's always would be, you know, peacemakers out there who, uh, for maybe good with good intentions, uh, might want to uh, engage the generals. And that would be, it's important to, to stay firm on that. Right. Well, I want to thank everyone who participated in this event, and I hope that the audience will take away the message that there's tremendous expertise and commitment and uh, collaboration in the movement to bring about a federal democratic union in Myanmar, and that there's much that the international community can do to support it. Thank you. Thank you.